Good day. Uh, my name is Dr. Brian Rivers from Morehouse School of Medicine, where I'm on the faculty of the Community Health and Preventive Medicine, um, and I also have the privilege and honor of directing the Cancer Health Equity Institute, um, a cancer center dedicated to uh, eliminating uh, cancer disparities and advancing cancer health equity. Well, it is, it is indeed an honor and privilege to be before you today, speaking from the topic, multi-level interventions in cancer prevention and control, a community-based translational research framework to address prostate cancer disparities. Um, just by way of introduction, um, I've been researching this topic for the past 15 years across the cancer continuum. And when I say cancer continuum, I mean from education and prevention, screening, early detection, uh, to um, diagnosis, treatment, um, as well as um, survivorship, um, all in the attempt to better understand um, and put interventions forth to eliminate the disproportionate burden that we see among African-American men as relates to prostate cancer. And more recently, my work has expanded to include breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer. But today I'll be presenting some of the work that we've been doing, um, funded by the National Institutes of Health on prostate cancer uh, disparities research. I'm a behavioral scientist by training uh, with a public health background. Um, I attended Vanderbilt undergrad, I majored in biology, minored in uh, molecular biology, and then went on and completed an MPH in social and behavioral sciences, um, sciences, and MPH being Master of Public Health. Then I went on and completed my PhD in health behavior at the University of Alabama at Birmingham in the School of Public Health. Um, and, and so again, a lot of my work has focused on um, community-based intervention, development and implementation and evaluation, um, utilizing um, evidence-based models such as the patient navigation model, um, the, uh, the role of theory, um, as well as community-based participatory research, all of the things that I will touch on in my topic. Um, so today, uh, the structure for this talk, um, we'll start off with overviewing the problem, um, and then we'll go into uh, some great detail about what is translational research, the framework that NIH has put forth um, for the scientific community to utilize as we operationalize um, this concept. Um, then I want to talk briefly about the science of community engagement and why it's so important um, as it relates to interfacing with minority communities. Um, and then strategies and approaches um, or the approach that we utilize to really um, better understand the role of informed decision making in non-clinical settings. Um, and then I will uh, culminate this presentation with um, just briefly a brief discussion on what we have learned and what should our next steps be. And so according to the American Cancer Society recent publication, Cancer Facts and Figures, uh, we know that prostate cancer is the most commonly diagnosed um, cancer among men, uh, followed by lung and colon. Um, and, and, and as it relates to um, women or females, we know that breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed um, cancer among women, followed by um, lung and colon as well. And so when we look at incidence rates or, um, you know, basically detailing how many individuals will be diagnosed with cancer in a given time period. And we see that cancer incidence rates are higher in males than in females for each racial and ethnic population represented in this bar graph. So at the bottom, I'm on the x-axis, we have non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian and Alaska Native, and then Hispanic. And as you can see, the difference in terms of incidence rates between um, racial and ethnic groups. The highest incidence rates, as you would note, are in blacks among males and in whites among females. And so you see, you know, sort of this disparity in terms of race and ethnicity, but you also see the same disparity or similar um, disparity as it relates to gender. Of note, Asian Pacific Islanders have the lowest rates um, among both sexes. And it's also important to note that these are broadly defined groups within which cancer rates vary substantially. Now, what do we mean by that? So we see non-Hispanic Black, realizing that you know, Black is not a monolith. Um, it's not a monolithic group. And so there's great cultural um, diversity and variation um, with, you know, within that category. Um, one could be of Jamaican descent, uh, African descent, um, Bahamian or other Caribbean descent. Um, similar to Hispanics, um, you know, we sort of lump these um, individuals together, um, but one could be from Puerto Rico um, or Central America or South America that all fit into that 
um, category of being Hispanic, uh, realizing that there may be some cultural variation that um, needs to be better understood to contextualize their health outcomes. So now when we look in terms of mortality rates or cancer death rates, uh, we see that cancer death rates are higher among males than among females for every racial and ethnic group. And then we also um, of note is that black males as well as black females have the highest cancer mortality in comparison to any other racial and ethnic group. And these are the reasons I, you know, we've set out with such a robust agenda as relates to better understanding the disproportionate impact of cancer on minority groups, in particular African Americans, because we know that this um, population, blacks in general, uh, male and female, are suffering um, when, uh, in, in comparison to, you know, others. Um, and, and we're trying to understand why. Why is this the case? Is it related to the biology of the individual? Um, is it related to uh, where one lives, work, and play? Um, or, or is it one's behavior, the things that they engage in, whether it's physical activity or um, their dietary patterns um, or, or, or smoking behavior or, or use of alcohol and other drugs? Um, or is it a combination of factors, including the environment, um, that has to be um, contextualized to better understand this disproportionate impact among this group? Now, we know that, you know, mortality rates are on the decline for all racial and ethnic groups, but the disparity remains. And um, we're seeing the extension of survival rates as illustrated in this particular um, diagram. Um, but, but, but again, you see when you do white and black comparisons, you see that, you know, blacks still have a much, much lower survival for many of the cancers listed and compared um, to whites. And again, the question begs why. So some postulated reasons, as I mentioned previously, include genetics, looking at the biological disposition. Are there known mutations in the genome that could account for the disproportionate impact of cancer on one population versus another? Is it lifestyle? Is it one's behavior, whether we focus on nutrition or physical activity um, or, or other behaviors that may be a detriment uh, leading to these adverse health outcomes among these different racial and ethnic groups? We understand access is a huge factor as well. There's been quite a bit of conversation, um, you know, in this country um, in terms of who's able to access the health care system and how um, effectively um, they're able to access and interface with their um, or the healthcare system. We know that the socioeconomic status, or SES, um, which is usually um, two measures put together, um, one at, at being education as well as income, um, you know, we, we, we know that those um, are factors as well. And we know that 24% of African Americans live below the federal poverty threshold versus 8% of whites. So that in part could um, dictate, you know, the level of access one may have, um, but there are um, in recent years, uh, programs and safety um, um, safety net type strategies that have been put forth to try and overcome access issues. And so now we're looking, we have a few studies that are actually looking at what happens once they are in the healthcare system. Um, and then lastly, patient provider uh, communication. And, and again, this is just one example of what goes on in the, in the encounter between uh, a patient and their provider, um, the role of health literacy, the role of um, uh, cultural um, sensitivity and appropriateness, um, just to name a few, um, and also um, health education and health promotion. Um, you know, all these are factors um, that we know impact the extent of the patient provider communication and whether that patient then uh, continues along the continuum or becomes stagnant. Other contributing factors, um, as evidenced in the um, current literature, um, we know that minority populations, especially African Americans, are more likely um, to be diagnosed at a later stage. Again, the cultural, historical, and social issues um, that you know uh, African Americans have, um, as well as other racial and ethnic groups, have encountered um, through their course in this country. Um, we were better understanding the role of misconceptions and fears and attitudes, and, and I think you know, the most prominent one, and, and I have it voted for a reason because the remainder of this presentation will focus on what we did to try and address the low levels of awareness and knowledge. Because oftentimes, you know, without the information, individuals just don't know what to do. And there's been quite a bit of confusing information, especially around prostate cancer screening, 
um, and, and the role of um, informed decision making or characterizing the delivery of informed decision making you know, has been uh, very limited to date. And, and so again, we have this population that is disproportionately impacted by um, prostate cancer, but then we're the, in, in times past, there has been mixed messaging around is um, should we be utilizing um, prostate cancer screening um, or, or is there a better, better biomarker other than the um, prostate specific antigen, uh, which is what is measured via the PSA test? Um, is, is that is do we have a better mark, better biomarker or, um, you know, and, and if we do, um, how do we implement that into routine care? And, and so there's been a number of limitations um, in terms of the studies that have attempted to answer this question, um, primarily due to the lack of representation of high-risk groups. Um, and, and so these studies did not enroll enough African-Americans or and or um, those with a family history of prostate cancer to high-risk populations um, that we have to do a better job with in terms of um, studying and researching then putting forth um, strategies. But we understand um, also from our recent efforts that there's a broad, broad, very broad category of factors that may in fact influence disparities in prostate cancer. Uh, more recently, the, I was fortunate enough to have been a part of a work group um, during my tenure on um, the National Advisory Council for the National Institutes on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And as a part of that work group, we put forth a new conceptual model, if you will, that really helps in the framing of disparities, looking at all the levels of influence, as well as those domains of influence that impact health outcomes. Now, this mom, this conceptual model is best um, when read from left to right, and then from uh, top to bottom. And as you can see, um, you know, it's bi-directional in scope, so we should not look at any of these different boxes in a linear fashion, but realize that there's an interactive component um, um, among these different concepts. And so real quickly going through the different levels of influence, you know, historically, I think we've done a great job in really better understanding um, the individual level of influence or what we call in our conceptual models, the intrapersonal level, um, you know, and that entails the individual in terms of their behavior, their personal environment, um, where they live, their cultural identity, um, and then their level of access to health care. Uh, but more recently, we've, we've come to better understand and appreciate um, the additional levels of influence, the interpersonal level, uh, which includes one's social network, the community level, again, where one lives, work, and play, and then societal level, which is inclusive of policy which is the principal governance structure for our society. And that really dictates the construction of our communities. And then the different domains of influence, whether the influence impacts the biological or the behavioral, um, or the physical and or sociocultural environment, or the health system it itself. Now, all of these are factors that we're putting forth that say, you know, uh, you don't have to address all of them at one time, but give consideration for whatever you're studying of these different concepts or these different levels of influence and the domains that they're influencing. And then how it basically dictates the health outcomes. So we're utilizing that framework. And again, it's intended to reflect an array of factors that are highly relevant for understanding and addressing minority health and health disparities. Um, what it encourages in, you know, in one's approach to individuals studying this particular problem is that it, it's a multifaceted and it's multi-level in scope, thus necessitates that type of approach as it relates to research. It also brings to attention health outcomes, not just at the individual level, but looking more um, broadly, more globally. You know, looking at the family, looking at the community, and also population levels. And then, you know, it's all, this business framework is also um, purpose to provide classific uh, classification scheme, if you will, for assessing the progress, the gaps, where they are, and then what opportunities we have to move forward. Um, so it's very calm, comprehensive in scope. I'm excited by it, um, just in terms of um, allowing us to advance our understanding of all of the factors involved in disparate outcomes among various racial and ethnic groups, as well as um, between genders. Um, what this framework is not intended to do, though, is to display directionality or specific causal pathways that then can be interpreted um, as an explanation for etiology or you know how disease um, you know begins. Um, 
is not an exhaustive representation of all theories or factors or mechanisms, but I think it captures, you know, a, um, a gauntlet of, uh, of those factors that we feel um, and that have been shown in previous research studies to be um, of importance. And, and, and so that then takes us to um, utilizing, understanding, you know, the array of factors that um, often are um, implicated as relates to the, um, propagating disparities and uh, serving as barriers to the advancement of health equity. You know, we have this translational science um, spectrum, um, you know, that a lot of individuals are now, up, um, you know, focused on, you know, we've had some great discoveries, we have some great advances. As I mentioned earlier, there's um, a current um, decline in mortality among racial and ethnic groups um, for, for most of our cancers. Um, but, you know, we still have this disparity that we need to better understand. And so how do we ensure that those discoveries that are made at the bench are translated to application in community-based settings? I mean, in clinical settings, excuse me, but then ultimately translated to benefit um, to populations um, as well as um, ultimately to the policy level. And so we utilize, you know, a translational science spectrum. And translational research fosters a multi-directional -direct integration of basic research, patient-oriented research, and population-based research with a long-term aim of improving the health of the public. And so as we think about the translation to the community level, we need to conceptualize and understand that there are uh, multiple types of community-engaged research. Um, of, of, of principal importance is uh, what is the community? Now, it all depends. There's no right or wrong answer, but it all depends on how you conceptualize what is community. Is it a geographical area captured by a zip code or or, or, or a city ordinance or, or, or state? Or, or could it be a community of individuals, a community of prostate cancer survivors or a community of um, black men interested in eliminating prostate cancer disparities. So again, it's very important in terms of how one conceptualizes community, the common unity um, around a particular area or topic. There's different types of community-engaged research. Of course, the uh, most, I think, widely popular one is a community-based research, um, and then practice-based research, um, and then there's also um, community-based participatory research, uh, which is not a recent concept, although in name it may be, but um, this model has been around for a while where you really engage the community and you empower the community to be equal participants in the conduct of research. And we're gonna go um, into greater detail on subsequent slides. So what is community-based participatory research? Well, it has been defined as a collaborative approach. And I think that's the key, a collaborative approach to research that equitably, um, if I had a highlighter, I'll highlight that word equitably, um, involves all partners in the research process and recognizes the unique strengths that each brings. So uh, myself as a researcher, as an academician, um, I will not go into any community thinking I have all the answers or I know what needs to happen. I understand what the data says. I understand trends in the data, um, and, and which suggests a particular approach. But I never say it's final when I go into the community. Um, we finalize the approach together. Um, and, and I will show forth some strategies that you can put forth that will allow you to help build that trust to ensure that the approach is collaborative and is equitable and that all individuals at the table are sharing in the power and the strengths that they um, bring, to, um, bring to a particular topic or problem. And so this is just um, a model um, the CBPR conceptual logic model. And you know, it's read from left to right, and it really goes into the different domains and the importance of understanding each of those domains and how those different areas can be conceptualized. For example, it starts with context and what context are you working within? Um, and again, this is important because it helps you frame the, um, how you're conceptualizing community uh, and so that everyone has a common understanding of what community is and what you're actually researching. Um, but then it also um, you know, provides, you know, basically uh, 
the basis for the type of theory that you're going to use, as well as um, your the, the evaluation um, that you're going to um, utilize to measure impact. And so again, various contexts are listed here, goes into great detail in the boxes. Uh, once you establish the context, then you look at group dynamics, um, and you start building out your partnership, um, realizing or, or detailing who should be at the table followed by the actual intervention and the research. What intervention does this population need? Um, and then uh, what will be the impact of that intervention? And that's where the research comes. And then what are the anticipated outcomes? And, and again, the outcomes could span the systems level um, all the way to um, the individual um, level, again, the intra level. And, and so, you know, this, I love this um, conceptual logic model because it really helps detail um, you know, step by step in terms of how one begins to conceptualize community and put forth an approach for CBPR. And so this is just an example of the role of the community in the research process. Again, as you can tell, um, it's not a linear model, but it's cyclic, meaning that, uh, you know, you continue with those. You don't complete a needs assessment and then move to identification of methods, um, but it's a process. And the process is continual. You're continuously evaluating the needs of the community that you're interfacing with. Um, you are continuously identifying the best methodology to put forth with this particular community, given um, the, the, the problem that you're studying. Um, then the design of the intervention, the implementation, the data collection methods, analyses, interpretation, um, dissemination of those study findings, which takes you back to the needs assessment. And again, it's cyclic. It's not a linear process where you do one, then it's sequential, then two, three, four, five, six. But those activities are continual. And and and, I, and, and yes, it's you know, labor intensive, um, you know, but that's the epitome. That is the basis. That is why, you know, individuals are really looking toward this process as a strength to um, conducting research because of the involvement at the community at every um, different stage. It never leaves out the community, never leaves out the academic, but it brings both together to really better understand the problem, to intervene on the problem, and then to evaluate it, and then um, take that information back out to the community. And, and so with that as a backdrop, you know, everything that I just touched on from the presenting the epidemiological data around the problem as it relates to prostate cancer and, um, and, 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 and uh, blacks or African Americans um, to, you know, the, the strength of the translational framework and bringing to bear um, those, into, those um, strategies um, to populations that desperately need them, um, being sure that they just don't you know, take residence um, in our um, scientific journals, but they're actually um, used to inform next steps and um, future policy. Then also we did a, a, a brief overview over a new conceptual model that the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities have put forth to help us conceptualize um, approaches for addressing disparities. And then lastly, we talked about um, CBPR. So now I want to bring all of these um, different components together and show forth what we did to address um, issues around prostate cancer screening among blacks in, the, um, in, in a couple of southern states in the United States. And so as it relates to prostate cancer screening, you know, there's been quite a bit of controversy um, around the two screening modalities. One, the prostate-specific antigen, which is a blood test measuring the level of um, um, of, uh, of PSA, of the prostate-specific antigen in the bloodstream. Um, the, and then the other is the digital rectal exam, or commonly referred to as a DRE, um, which is basically inserting the um, finger, a glove um, finger in the rectum and checking for any firmness or um, any um, stiffness of the prostate gland. Um, you know, that's the standard of care currently in terms of how we um, measure uh, or we screen for prostate cancer. But it's important to note um, that to date, there's been no randomized clinical trial um, showing early detection of prostate cancer by uh, either the DRE or the PSA decreases morbidity um, and or mortality. 
Um, we know that there's issues around false positive screening tests. And what do we mean by false positive? Um, meaning that there are some screening tests that says um, that you have a high level of PSA um, in your bloodstream or, um, uh, you know, you, um, you know, your prostate gland may uh, be enlarged or may be infected and, and therefore you get a, pos a positive reading. Um, and we know that this false positive can then lead to overdiagnosis of men who may not necessarily benefit from any intervention because it may not be cancer. It could be, you know, some other reason um, why um, there's a high amount of PSA in the bloodstream. And then we know that these adverse treatment outcomes for prostate cancer could lead to very um, complicated um, you know, side effects that diminish this quality of life for the individual, and these include impotence, um, incontinence, um, strictures, bowel injury, injury, and then sometimes um, death. So, what has been put forth as a uh, you know, from the scientific community and the clinical community, for that matter, is that individuals should engage in shared decision making. You know, um, one should um, take note of how the patient benefits. Um, how the patient is able to take an active role in his health care, um, become better informed, and chooses the option that is most consistent with his or um, his personal preferences. Um, you know, these are put forth, have been put forth as potential benefits. And then how the clinician benefits, you know, it helps them solve a particular clinical dilemma, especially around prostate cancer with high risk groups, such as those with a family history and or black men. Um, because again, we have this disparity before us, but then we have some confusion in terms of if I uh, should or should not be screened um, as an individual, um, as a man first, but then as an individual that may be at increased risk for prostate cancer, realizing that there re there's really only three risk factors for prostate cancer. Um, one being um, African-American and Black. Um, the second one, having a family history of this disease. And then the third one, as one uh, is age, as one gets older, you're more likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer. So we know recent reports have you know, pretty much dictate, um, dictated to us some of the causal factors and some, um, some of those mediators um, and moderators that may be involved um, with this, this, this disproportionate impact of prostate cancer on black men. Uh, we know that African-American men are more likely to experience poor treatment outcomes as dictated by this, um, both the unequal burden of cancer. Uh, we know that African-Americans are also more likely um, to be less satisfied with treatment outcomes, um, endure greater symptom distress, and um, have more persisting urinary bowel and sexual symptoms, ultimately, you know, experiencing some family disruption. Um, and then again, pointing to the notion, as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, we also know that recent studies have really pointed to the fact that, you know, African Americans are more likely to report having low access to educational and psychosocial interventions to really under better understand the disease and what they should be doing about the disease. A uh, recent report um, by the Institute of Medicine entitled From Cancer Patient to Cancer Survivor, I mean, really chronicled for the first time um, comprehensively the psychosocial needs as well as services that most patients, most cancer patients um, you know, need or expect uh, post-treatment. Um, and, and then also across the continuum, what are some of those information gaps? Um, that can be best addressed to help with movement across a cancer continuum, realizing that oftentimes if individuals um, are, are fearful, um, which is very resonant among many, once they hear the words, you have cancer, then it's, it, that becomes sort of um, stagnant or it, it stifles them going on to treatment as well as other next steps um, to really free them from cancer or cure them from cancer. So some of their um, information needs um, as dictated within this comprehensive report by the Institute of Medicine included information about their illness, information about available treatments, um, information about other health and services that may be available to help them eliminate some of the suffering as a result of treatment as they enter into phases of survivorship. Other um, psychosocial needs and services um, needed as chronicled in this book included um, assistance in coping with emotions, accompanying illness and treatment, um, assistance in managing their illness, and then also assistance in making those lifestyle modifications um, should they be needed. Um, and these include um, 
you know, changes in smoking behavior, exercising more, changes in diet, um, interfacing with your position more, and really setting up a framework of surveillance um, to assist with um, eliminating, you know, um, you know any suffering, um, uh, you know, related to this particular disease. And then a couple of years later, um, after the release of the uh, um, 2006 Institute of Medicine report, uh, the Institute of Medicine came out with um, a companion report, if you will, um, entitled Cancer Care for the Whole Patient. And again, it really talked about, you know, what the patient needs, um, the type of services that they are in need of, and what strategies we can put forth um, to really account for these needs. And out of that came the recommendation, um, as well as the previous report, is that every patient should have some type of um, navigational um, service available to them to help them navigate from treatment into survivorship and to different specialists to eliminate some of their mid side effects of treatment. And also every patient should receive some type of sum summation of uh, what happened to them. Uh, we call that a treatment summary. Um, a really crawling code is the type of treatment they had, the type of disease they were diagnosed with, um, the stage of the disease, the grade of the, um, of the disease, and uh, the, the, the selected treatment um, that uh, was administered. Um, but, but, but then also what they can expect as they transition to survivorship, and we call that a survivorship care plan. And so, you know, those are two overarching recommendations that came out, which they felt would help eliminate a lot of the um, gaps um, that, you know, that we see in um, cancer care um, and, and delivery. And, and so with that information, um, you know, we it helped frame our study, um, you know, as it relates to really better understanding some of the information deficits that needed to be addressed, um, as well as, um, you know, the approach. So we utilize a social um, ecological model, very similar to what we saw in the NIMHD framework, um, looking at multiple levels of influence, realizing that the individual is influenced by their family, their friends, and their social networks, which are then influenced by um, organizations or organizational cultures and social institutions, which is ultimately influenced by the community in which these organizations reside in. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you know, public policy is that principal governance structure, um, whether it's national policy or state or local policy, um, it matters in terms of um, how one is able to access health. And so what I want to present to you um, is a single arm feasibility study um, where we receive funding um, through the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities um, you know, to, to one, examine, you know, the impact of a multi-level intervention targeting African-American men who's at increased risk for prostate cancer. We put forth multi-level, uh, again, looking at thinking back to the NIMHD framework and realizing that there's multiple levels of influence and there's multiple domains that we need to account for. And, and so um, we put forth a multi-level community-based educational approach. We utilize community health workers um, that we then train to work in community-based settings such as barbershops, churches, and health fairs. We utilize empirically tested, tested and evaluated um, patient decision aids. Um, and, and then we evaluate it from an exploratory standpoint, the role of emerging technology um, to ensure a standard message was um, received by participants, given that this was in a non-clinical setting. And so these are the components based again on, you know, everything that I presented thus far, you know, based on data, uh, based on national reports that dictated strategies to help with eliminate the suffering. Um, you know, we put forth, you know, I, I think a very strong model um, to deal with all of those factors in that framework that could potentially impact um, the disparity that we see among African-American men. And so the aims that guided the study, um, one, to evaluate the effectiveness of the enhanced patient decision aid entitled, is the PSA test right for you in the delivery of culturally, linguistically, and literacy relevant topics on the informed decision making to African-American men? That was phase one. Phase two entailed evaluating a training program for community health workers to disseminate educational messages on um, IDM for prostate cancer screening to African-American men utilizing methods grounded in community-based participatory research. 
And then lastly, we um, set out to compare the effectiveness of a community-based education program guided by community health workers and an enhanced patient decision aid with usual care in clinical settings and the dissemination of informed decision-making to African-American men. And again, um, you know, this is really important because while the recommendation has been forth that all men should engage in the shared decision-making process and men should make an informed decision as relates to if screening is right for them, based on previous studies, and I showed this in previous slides, African-Americans are more likely to state they have low levels of awareness and knowledge about prostate cancer. So how can they then effectively engage in a shared decision-making process? The conversation will be just sort of unidirectional. And then again, the utilization of community health workers, which is an, iter is an iteration of um, the patient navigation model, um, you know, again, deals with the context so it goes beyond the individual, but deals with the context or the community in which the individual resides. And, and so we're not only impacting the psyche with the education and the information that the patient decision aid delivers, but then we're also dealing with the context in which the individual decides. So the community health worker could help them with access to care, access to screening, to better understand understanding uh, why if, if screening is right for them or if there was anything that needed clarified in the patient decision aid, that community health worker was trained to be able to provide, assist in that regard. And so again, this model we think, you know, has a potential to address not just um, individuals' knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, but also the context, which we know and we better understand now, which is very important. And so here's our multi-level framework. It was guided um, by the interdependence model of social influence and interpersonal communication. Again, really attending to how we communicate and those influences at the inter and community levels and how they influence ultimately health outcomes. So we um, took into consideration the social norms, the relationship characteristics, um, the larger system that individuals operate in, um, as well as the social demographic factors, realizing that all of these are factors that impact communication. Then we looked at the agents of social influence, in our, this case, community health worker or the lay health advisor, and then the targets or the recipients of, um, of these um, services, African-Americans, and ultimately um, the outcome was um, were they in a place um, to engage in informed decision-making and what were their um, behavioral intentions around screening. Were they ready to be screened or did they want to wait and receive more information to determine if screening was right for them? Here's a study overview. Um, three sequential phases, or actually phase one and two are concurrent, um, and then phase three followed phases um, one and two. Phase one, we uh, put the patient decision aid um, you know, before the target audience. Um, we wanted to go through um, formative research techniques to ensure that um, the, the patient decision aid or the intervention that we wanted to utilize to you know, increase information, to increase knowledge, to increase awareness, um, resonated culturally and linguistically with the population. And so we assessed that during phase one. And then concurrently during phase two, we actually recruited and trained and evaluated our community health workers. And then phase three was the actual implementation of the study. And so just I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail of each of the different phases. So again, as a reminder, um, aim one was to evaluate the effectiveness of the enhanced patient decision aid and the delivery of culturally and linguistically and literacy relevant topics on informed decision making to African American men. And so what did we do? We wanted to, um, one, inform the cultural adaptation or assess if a cultural adapting the patient decision aid was needed. Um, we um, wanted to conduct pre-test iterations of the um, enhanced decision aid, um, and then consult with medical and technological experts on those modifications that we made. 
Um, and, and so how do we do this? Well, we did this um, through um, the use of qualitative research methods, um, focus groups, pre-testing iterations, which um, entail key informant interviews or um, face-to-face -face interviews with the target audience, and then learner, uh, learner verification techniques, which entails a process of um, performing adaptations to a particular intervention and then putting them back before the target audience or, or at least the representation of the audience that you're looking to intervene with to see if the changes that were made resonated, um, you know, with, um, with, you know, with the um, population of study. And so this was phase one, our formative research techniques. Um, we um, um, interfaced with about 18 black men. Their um, average age was about 48. Um, and, and again, this took place in, um, in, in Florida. Um, and so you see the breakdown there in terms of the, the representativeness of individuals from St. Pete as well as Tampa. Um, most of the individuals reported being married um, and some type of education, mostly uh, most were either at the high school and or um, some college level. And only about uh, nearly 40% reported um, being previously screened for prostate cancer. So some of the key things that are that, that, that emerged during phase one um, in ascertaining if we needed to adapt the patient decision aid, and in fact, we actually had to, um, uh, the, the participants wanted more information related to sources of health information. What are some credible sources? Um, we have this great, wonderful internet before us that you know has a wide breadth of information, but a lot of participants wanted to know how do you determine credible reliable information. There's a lot on there about prostate cancer. There's a lot on there about prostate cancer screening, but how do we know what is uh, the most credible information as we do not have a ranking of our health websites? Um, it could be one person sharing their opinion, sharing their experience versus a, a uh, an expert really detailing what the data states um, or, you know, the most recent uh, research finding state. Um, and so there's there's quite a bit of confusion in terms of, you know, what is a credible source of information? So we cleared that up. Um, trustworthiness was also a key thing that um, emerged. How can I trust this information when you know, some of the participants quoted um, as saying that the information seemingly changes every six, eight uh, months? And they also cited um, you know, the role of mammograms. And, you know, there's been quite a bit of confusion around, you know, the utility of mammograms and the frequency of mammograms as well. And then sharing of information in the community. Um, how do you share this information in a setting that's more trusted, um, where individuals can involve their social network in receiving this information as well to help them decide um, what's best for them? Um, also detailing some of the important issues about prostate cancer. Why is there a disparity, you know, uh, you know, what is our current knowledge about prostate cancer, especially in the context of this um, persistent disparity? And what are some of the factors associated with the disparity? Individuals wanted to hear more of a dialogue and conversation, you know, along those lines. And then some of the barriers and benefits to prostate cancer screening, um, if there's any cultural issues that need to be addressed, um, you should address those as well. And, and then uh, what is informed decision making and how is it measured? These are all the key things that emerge from our formative research. So we did not take something that, you know, worked for one group and then apply it to another group thinking we were going to have the same outcomes, but we put it before the uh, representative um, 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 number of individuals from our um, anticipated target audience to ensure or, or to evaluate, um, would this intervention um, resonate with you? Are there things that are missing um, that should be included in this particular intervention? And in fact, we found that they were. And so this, the next couple of slides are just how we address the issues, um, you know, as it relates to sources of health information. Um, you know, we, we attempted to include perspectives from each of those, um, you know, sources listed on your screen from the physician and the healthcare provider. Um, we attempted to identify, you know, sound websites that individuals can go to um, to receive credible health information, salient information. Um, and, and then we included information for um, their social network, um, uh, including friends and peers, as well as their family members. 
in just a little bit more detail on the trustworthiness of the information. Um, participants felt uh, that the information should come from a person who was trusted um, to, um, due to their relationship, for example, um, a wife, a friend, or family member, uh, more based on their skills or training, such as a doctor. Yes, again, ensuring, ensuring receptivity of information. Uh, however, there were some mixed results regarding trusting doctors. Um, some of the participants um, stated that um, with their advanced studies and training, doctors should know what they're talking about, but others stated that you still have to double check the information as um, today's medicine is yesterday's research and the information changes quite frequently. And so, you know, there was sort of a mix and we attempted to address this by including both um, perspectives from um, both thoughts. And as it relates to knowledge about, um, about prostate cancer, although most of the participants had heard of prostate cancer, very few had any knowledge of prostate cancer. Some had heard about screening and treatment, but did not know much about what this meant or included. And some knew that prostate cancer was more prevalent among black men um, and older men. But again, the reasons as to why was um, unclear. Um, cultural issues, um, social cultural norms and beliefs um, they felt should be addressed as relates to black men. Um, so not this sort of homo, um, this one size fit all approach, but we should um, do our due diligence to make sure that the patient decision aid really speaks to those issues that are germane to um, African Americans. Um, and some of these included not going to the doctor, um, this notion of homophobia associated with the digital rectal exam, um, other misconceptions and fears that were. Um, that, that, that are resident among African Americans or Blacks, um, the cultural relevance and understanding of those who are actually um, doing um, the speaking um, should be taken into consideration. So basically, someone who looked like them or were from their respective communities who, you know, were trusted individuals they felt was the best model to put forth. Um, then as it relates to informed decision making, uh, many participants agreed that they needed to make their own decision regarding screening. Um, due to their lifestyle, as well as other personal factors and that level of variation from person to person. Um, there was some concern about the uncertainty of outcomes, such as quality of life, that is often associated with uh, prostate cancer treatment, um, as well as the costs. And then recommendation from their family members um, to be involved um, resonated uh, loud and clear um, within our formative research. And again, pointing to the fact that individuals, I mean, at least African American or Blacks, don't make decisions in isolation, but you know, involve their social network or go back to our social ecology model or even the NIMHD framework, that interpersonal level. So it's extremely important that, you know, for that, that we put in place um, you know, sources of information for these individuals as well to facilitate the um, decision-making process. And other recommendations that emerge um, included men and doctors. Um, you know, if you include them in a patient decision, they should vary in age from young and old. Um, there should be some supplemental tools on the internet, such as blogging and websites, television ads and mail outs um, to, convince, to continue to convey that information because um, right uh, Back then, it was just all in the clinical setting. And oftentimes, that clinical um, encounter was limited to seven to 10 minutes. So there wasn't much time for health education and health promotion activities, but more so um, surveillance and diagnosis. Uh, men also suggested maybe having two separate patient decision aids, one completely with the pros and one completely with the cons to help sort out the issue, um, the issues and help men make a decision. And then lastly, they thought that the video should be tailored or targeted to older men, but then also to younger men, their wives and families, given that you know younger men may have um, younger kids and fertility um, preservation, among other things, uh, may be of consideration in their decision-making process that may not be factors for older men. So in phase two, um, we set out to train our community um, health workers. Um, the community health worker, just um, from a historical context, um, is a model that was developed by the federal government in the 1960s uh, with the goal of reaching people in underserved communities and presenting health as well as screening information. So this model has been around for over 50 years. The philosophy of this model is to train selected community members in specific health topics so that they may then serve as an educational resource to other community members in making the appropriate health decisions. 
a common limitation to um, implementing this implementing this model within a community-based participatory strategy is a lack of evaluation of assessing the accuracy as well as the comprehensiveness of the information and education that's often provided by these individuals. So utilization um, of uh, mobile health um, could potentially um, serve as a um, as a method for standardizing that which is communicated to um, impacted communities. Um, but again, um, it remains unknown if African American men are receptive to utilizing mobile tablet technology to receive health, ed health education and health promotion messaging. And so again, um, to summarize this particular slide, we knew that the community health and worker model was great for really interfacing in different aspects of the community, whether it's the barbershop, whether it's the church, whether it's um, different gatherings in the park or the laundromat, or just going where community members go. We knew that that model was great. But then the question was, we have this fantastic decision aid that we just adapted. What is the best method of delivering it? Well, we thought, you know, we could do paper, we can do brochures, um, but how about doing something interactive? How about doing something that ensures that the message is salient and relevant to the um, um, target audience? So we decided to utilize mobile tablet, mobile tablet technology. And we call this a mobile health intervention. Um, and so it, it helped us with the dilemma of ensuring that a standardized message was provided to the um, community members. Um, and then it took the onus off of the um, community health worker to better understand all of the nuances associated with um, the recommendations around uh, prostate cancer um, screening. And so within the training, we trained them on um, utilizing, you know, the iPad. Uh, we had a module on technology integration, the use of the iPad and delivering information, again, in community-based settings. Other training topics included the basics of prostate cancer and then screening, um, prostate cancer screening, benefits, risks, limitations, alternatives, as well as uncertainties. And all of this was presented uh, within the framework of Freer's empowerment or education model and the CBPR framework. Um, and some of the training um, methods, um, evaluation metrics included um, um, different questionnaires. We um, employed a one group pre post um, test design, meaning we, we did a survey at the beginning of the training, and then we did a survey at the end of the training to evaluate the impact of the training. Some of the sample questions from that um, survey included, uh, what is a community health worker? So dealing with a construct of role delineation. Uh, what are the core competencies of this model? What are some of the qualities of the community health workers that help them conduct their work? And uh, how do we demonstrate effective communication strategies? So phase three was the actual implementation of the patient decision aid, as well as a community health worker model in community-based settings. And again, the patient decision aid was delivered via mobile tablet um, technology. And so a similar design was ensued um, to uh, evaluate the impact of this multi-level intervention. Um, we, we captured demographic variables, a primary outcome of interest was captured at baseline and two weeks post-intervention. And our primary outcomes of interest was IDM and I, informed decision-making. And it was conceptualized through um, three different constructs, uh, prostate cancer knowledge, on decisional conflict, as well as decision on self-efficacy. This is just an overview. We started off with um, the community health worker identifying eligible participants, again, whether in a barbershop, a beauty salon, or a church, um, or some type of community setting. Write an overview of the study and invited them to participate. Conduct an informed consent, followed by the baseline, a pre-survey. We delivered the intervention over a course of uh, Actually, this, I think, was one week. Um, and, and then we conducted a post-survey. Then we had a two-week uh, follow-up um, to ascertain um, what their intentions were as relates to um, prostate cancer screening. And with that, for their participation, we provided remuneration, the amount of a $20 uh, gift card. So these are the results. And as you can see, uh, we had some significant changes um, as relates to changes in knowledge self-efficacy as well as decision conflict. We um, 
recruited 152 African American men, um, you know, into the study. We look more specifically as it relates to um, prostate cancer knowledge. Um, you know, we see that there. I mean, this work has been published um, in the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Underserved. We see that the changes in knowledge based on education, income, and marital status and age. We saw more change around those who were college educated, who had an income greater of 48,000 or more, who were married and were over the age of 60. But if you look, if you look at the difference in the mean, um, in the, uh, mean scores, even for those individuals um, that um, had less than a college education or made less than 48,000 a year or were unmarried, we still saw decreases in their scores, meaning the impact of the intervention um, impacted their those domains as well, regardless of um, their education, income, marital status, or age. Um, it impacted their um, prostate cancer knowledge overall. Um, and so that's important to note, although it wasn't significant among that group, was significant with the other group, but we did see changes across the board. Same thing with um, prostate cancer screening self-efficacy, uh, one's ability to engage in um, screening. We saw that um, there it was a much significance again among those with the college education, uh, those who made at least forty-eight thousand or more, those who were married, and um, you know again those who um, were sixty plus years of age. Then the last construct. Sorry, um, decisional conflict. Um, you know, we saw significant changes as well among the same group. Um, and, and so, data from the two-week follow-up interviews um, uh, really show forth that there was an increase in individuals who um, intended to go and be screened for prostate cancer. Um, and then, after the study, we also sat down with the community health workers um, and conducted interviews to uh, basically capture their, the extent of the interaction. Between, um, between the participant and the community health workers, um, and, and, and again, uh, really identifying if um, this uh, model should be put forth and go further. Um, again, just some of the data that you know was captured. We asked some a lot of the participants, a lot of the participants two weeks post the intervention, uh, since the discussion with the community um, health worker, who have you spoken with? Who have you shared this knowledge with? And mostly say their social network, whether it was a family member and or a friend. And, and so we see that this sharing of information within their social network um, to help them in their decision making um, was uh, congruent with previous studies um, that talked about the importance of the interpersonal um, level. Um, and, and so, you know, going forward, we, you know, we make it a point and we, you know, we publish this and put this in our, um, in, you know, in our manuscripts uh, related to this particular study. You know, we can't negate the importance of the social network. So when we're building out our interventions, they should not just focus on the individual or the patient themselves, but consider those individuals that are around the patient or the participant and, 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 and proceed accordingly. So the results of this study... prostate cancer after interacting with the community health worker. 95% felt that the community health worker was knowledgeable and a credible source of information, again, tending to this notion or the theme that emerged in the formative research related to the patient decision aid, uh, you know, credible sources of information. And then over 50% of the participants stated that they actually spoke with a family member or a friend after their interaction with the community health worker about prostate cancer. So again, attending to the role of the interpersonal um, you know, level um, and how one should intervene on that level in addition to the intra or the individual level. And so real quickly, as it relates to um, our evaluation of the technology, you, know, you hear some of the individuals say, will the technology exasperate disparities? Will it put a wedge in between um, minority populations and others? Um, and, and so we set out to um, evaluate the usability of um, you know, this, um, our intervention or the use of mobile tablet technology. So what is usability? Basically, the extent to which a product can be used by specified users to achieve specific, specified goals with effectiveness efficiency and satisfaction in a specified context of use. 
Usability is usually measured or evaluated by user-driven or expert-driven um, um, approaches. And so we put forth the user-driven approach to evaluate um, the use or the delivery of our patient decision aid via an iPad. These are just some examples of the questions that uh, we put forth. And then we did a, a, a usability evaluation of the actual patient decision aid itself. And again, these are just some of the questions that we put forth in evaluation of um, the uh, app. So we have 53 participants. Um, mean age is about 41 years. Um, the range was between 18 and 69 years old, um, and, and about 20, 29 were male. And so as you can see, um, the breakdown for education and income is represented by the pie charts. Majority having uh, reporting an, an income of 20 to 60,000, and the majority reporting some type of vocational school or some college. Again, these are the measurements that were, that were utilized. Um, Two aspects that we measured, um, general ease of use, mainly of the iPad itself, and then studied specific ease of use, mainly the uh, patient decision aid or the app in which we delivered the patient decision aid um, to participants. And so overall, um, the individuals felt that um, it was very easy to use as represented um, you know, in, in, in the blue-green um, bar. And then the study specific ease of use um, was likewise very well received. Um, individuals did not report any challenges with utilizing um, this particular uh, modality to receive information. We conducted uh, one-way ANOVAs looking at uh, if education level was a factor. Um, and we found that participants' education levels did not have any significant um, effect on their assessment on um, general ease of use or study uh, specific ease of use. We looked at the role of income. Again, um, you know, we saw this differential impact in the intervention as relates to education and income. So we wanted to see if there was any, um, what was the role of education and or income as relates to the receipt of technology or the use of technology for health, um, health seeking be, uh, uh, behaviors. And again, participants' income levels did not have any um, significant effect on their assessment of ease of use. Um, and study specific ease of use. And so in, in, in conclusion, um, the increasing complexity of information on the prostate cancer continuum challenges patients in acquiring adequate resources for the information needs. The use of technology we think will ensure the delivery of a consistent and educational, uh, of a consistent educational content, thereby reducing the information variation often associated with community-based education. Multi-level interventions we found was feasible to implement using a CBPR framework. We also found that it was feasible to train community health workers to deliver a mobile tablet delivered intervention. Overall, the participants found the patient decision aid to be uh, easy to use. Neither their education level or income level had any significant effect on the evaluation of the patient decision aid. And this is important because as you can see, you know, we're, we're starting to see a spike and um, in the incidence of metastatic prostate cancer among men. And um, we don't know, um, study has not been conducted to detail if this spike in advanced stage disease is the end result of the confusion around the recommendations for prostate cancer screening, where you have a group that decided not to be screened while some just sort of waited in the middle. Um, oh, and then some, of course, went on and got screened, but you know, this is a disease when found early is 100% treatable. Um, once it becomes stage three or stage four or metastatic, uh, you know, that's when it causes a lot of problems and the cure rate um, goes from, you know, 90 uh, to the nine from the 90th percentile down to the 30th and 40th percentile. And, and so it's incumbent that we get the messaging out um, as we realize that there is an uptake of advanced stage disease um, in the in a disease that when um, found early enough is definitely untreatable. Um, individuals are living beyond the 10 year survival mark. So final thoughts, um, 
you know, having a community advisory board consisting of community members, healthcare providers, research and researchers, academicians um, involved in identification and selection of community health workers was extremely important and beneficial. Our community health worker training program was based on adult learning principles and utilized didactic group role playing and actual field work to enhance critical thinking and problem solving skills among community health workers. Uh, we found that the multi-method monitoring and evaluation to assess knowledge change and retention, as well as performance, um, was extremely beneficial um, toward um, operationalizing the community health worker model. I think it was extremely important that we do not just utilize the patient decision aid that had been used with um, other populations, but the, the incorporating community perspectives helped define um, and identify a range of research options um, and provided a foundation for working with community partners to develop community-based translational research. Again, bringing you know, the most uh, recent and salient findings um, to uh, communities that are um, you know, disproportionately impacted by you know, disease um, that can really stand to benefit from these advances. Uh, the community-based theory approach um, identify community relevant research questions and methods to address current gaps in our understanding of prostate cancer disparities across the continuum. And the process and outcomes demonstrate how community perspectives and scientific theory can inform the development of translational research addressing prostate cancer disparities across various levels of influence. Um, in our study, we found that the community members were actively engaged in the study, which helped build trust um, with um, academic institutions. It also enabled the community health workers um, you know, to possess health-related knowledge, communication skills, and leadership experience that will extend long beyond the study. Um, and we, again, um, left the iPads in uh, with the community health workers and in key uh, community settings as well. CBPR in tandem with community health workers is a valuable approach for engaging African-American men. It is able to attenuate not only to establishing trust, but also uh, um, addressing those cultural factors that we know are important, um, you know, among minority populations. Um, involvement on multi-levels, such as the community members, organizations, the academic institutions, hospitals, uh, community health care providers, aided in acceptance and sustainability of the intervention. So again, you know, it was important in terms of how we conceptualize um, this intervention and the inclusion of multiple domains of influence as well as multiple levels of influence. And so future approaches um, nestled within the DNI framework or um, the implementation of the simulation science framework, um, we would definitely foster and advocate for the utilization of community health workers. Um, that model um, uh, is of immense value. Um, and it has great promise in how we translate our findings um, to um, the benefit of different communities. Um, could uh, have potential application in the context of increasing readiness of populations, minority populations, to engage in community-based biospecimen collection. As we know, diversification in many of our clinical trials, as well as our um, research studies, remain a problem. Um, and the community health worker could be one um, strategy toward addressing that issue because without that level of diversification, then how do we know um, drug discovery will be beneficial for all individuals? And so we've seen, we're seeing an increase in the number of individuals in the context of cancer that are failing treatment or treatment is failing them. Uh, we need to have better representation. So as these new drug targets are developed, we can ensure that they're representative and generalizable to all individuals. Um, and then community-based um, education um, via technology, I think, uh, resonates very well um, um, in terms of moving forward in terms of leveraging technology to help standardize the messaging and the approach um, within community-based settings um, will, will give us the same level of uh, credibility that one receives or has um, receiving information in clinical settings. So again, this is just an example of, you know, the how in terms of you know, how do we get this type of work done? 
um, here at Morehouse School of Medicine, we are committed to leading the creation and advancement of health equity by bringing research to the community. And this is just one example through our mobile research unit that's equipped to do focus groups, conduct surveys, um, and even to um, collect bio, um, different biospecimens. And, and, and so, you know, as we transform the landscape um, to really go to the people as opposed to waiting for individuals to come to us, uh, we really are confident with, that these approaches will help us um, advance health equity and decrease the disparities that we see. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention this, um, this, um, this today. Um, and and I'll, of course, would like to acknowledge our funding, um, our sponsor, um, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Uh, this is funded under their Comparative Effectiveness Research for Eliminating Disparities Initiative. Um, and it was um, close to $2 million investment um, to implement this two-year project. So we're very fortunate um, for the resources that were provided um, by NIH and NIMHD. Uh, again, thank you, and uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I think my contact information um, is listed with this presentation. Uh, I can be um, uh, contacted via B Rivers, B as in boy, Rivers, R I V E R S at MSM.edu. That's Morehouse School of Medicine.edu, MSM. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. Hope you enjoyed um, the presentation and have a great day.